God, you are owner of all things by right. You are the one who called all things into existence out of nothing. You therefore have a right over every piece of clay to do with as you will. And that we, your people, would be vessels of your mercy is truly a staggering thought. When we consider who we are and what we've done, when we think about what it is uh, that we have offended you with from our very nature and by our activities, we are amazed at your grace, amazed that we still stand on your green earth, that we breathe your air, that our hearts beat with borrowed pulses. Truly, we owe everything to you and we could give nothing to you that would be pleasing to you. And yet in your grace and your mercy, you have seen fit to transform your people, to grant to them grace, to live lives pleasing to you, to even prepare and advance good works that they would walk in. And Lord, that is our desire to be useful to you, to be pleasing to you, to let the words of the songs we just sang reverberate through our lives. God, we pray for wisdom, for insight, uh, to live as you would have us live in this fleeting world. And we pray that you would use the book of Daniel in our lives from this day forward to motivate us to think with an eternal perspective, to think about the world around us as that which will soon meet you. And we pray that we would be ambassadors of preparation for your kingdom. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to wrap up the book of Daniel this evening, and we're going to do that with a Q&A. As you're thinking about the questions you would like to ask, I am going to disappoint you. This is not a Q&A where you ask questions and I give you answers. This is a question and answer that is right here in the text of Daniel, and we're going to follow along. The questions and the answers will be our outline this evening. They're supplied right here in the last nine verses of the book of Daniel. Follow along with me and I'll read our text for the evening, Daniel 12, beginning in verse 5. Then I, Daniel, looked and behold, two others were standing, one on this bank of the river and the other on that bank of the river. And one said to the man dressed in linen who was above the waters of the river, how long will it be until the end of these wonders? I heard the man dressed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, as he raised his right hand and his left hand toward heaven, and swore by him who lives forever, that it would be for a time, times, and half a time. And as soon as they finish the shattering, the power of the holy people, all these events will be completed. As for me, I heard, but could not understand. So I said, my Lord, what will be the outcome of these events? He said, go your way, Daniel, for these words are concealed and sealed up until the end time. Many will be purged, purified and refined, but the wicked will act wickedly and none of the wicked will understand, but those who have insight will understand. From the time that the regular sacrifice is abolished and the abomination of desolation is set up, there will be 1,290 days. How blessed is he who keeps waiting and attains to the 1,335 days. But as for you, go your way to the end. Then you will enter into rest and rise again for your allotted portion at the end of the age. Here it is, the end of the book of Daniel. We've come some distance. We've looked at the lives of some Hebrew youth who were faithful to Yahweh in their youth in Babylonian captivity, exiled at 15 years old or so. We see the life of Daniel lived faithfully well into his ninth decade. And we have traipsed through the course of human history from the Babylonian captivity of the Jewish exiles to the end of time. And we're closing up our study of this book with these questions and answers. 
These might be the very questions you would ask if you were in Babylonian captivity hearing Daniel's prophecy for the first time. If you were standing on the banks of the Tigris River and you were watching two angels ask another supernatural being some questions, these might be the ones you would think of. Look at verse 5. Here's Daniel, two angelic beings, and the Tigris River. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, two others were standing, one on this bank of the river and the other on that bank of the river. And we know this is the Tigris because this scene extends all the way from chapter 10, and chapter 10, verse 4, names the river for us. And we are still in that same final vision of Daniel's book. And look down at verse 6. And one, that is one of these angelic beings, said to the man dressed in linen who was above the waters of the river, how long will it be until the end of these wonders? Who is this man dressed in linen? If you go back to Daniel chapter 10, verses 5 through 9 depict, I believe, a different character than the angelic beings in the rest of Daniel chapter 10. And when we studied through this, I... I made the contention that this is the pre-incarnate Christ. And the pre-incarnate Christ figure here resembles so closely the picture of Christ in Revelation chapter 1 that I believe it is a reasonable interpretation to take this as Christ himself. If Daniel 10, 5 to 9 depicts Christ, then Daniel 12, 6 and 7 also depict him for this is the same man dressed in linen, hovering above the waters. He is depicted here as being above the angels. He is hovering over the waters while the two angelic beings are on the land on either bank of the river. This seems to be a supernatural and perhaps authoritative stance. This one has the answers to the questions the angels are asking and the answers to Daniel's questions. And again, I believe there are significant parallels to the vision of Christ in Revelation chapter 1. Turn with me there just for a moment. Unmistakably, Revelation chapter 1 depicts the glorified Christ. And you'll remember that John the Revelator was the one who leaned against the bosom of Christ at the Last Supper. They were good friends. There was intimate companionship. There was human familiarity. And this same John encounters Christ glorified in Revelation chapter 1. He says in verse 12, I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me. Having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. In the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like a son of man, clothed in a robe, reaching to the feet, girded across his chest with a golden sash. His head and his hair were white like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. All of these things are repeated for us in, or prepeated, if we could say it that way, in Daniel 7, 9 and Daniel 10, 6. His feet were like burnished bronze when it has been made to glow in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in its strength. Can you imagine the scene? Have you been to Niagara Falls? Have you been to Yellowstone and heard Yellowstone Falls thumping and pounding the rocks at the base of the falls? Have you been to the North Shore in Hawaii and heard heavy waters on a big break hitting the beach, cracking thunderous sounds across the coastline? Can you imagine standing in front of one whose voice was like the sound of many waters? Could you imagine staring at one whose face shone like the sun in its strength? This was John in the presence of Jesus. He had seen Jesus before, but not like this. Notice John's response. I saw him. I fell at his feet like a dead man. He placed his right hand on me saying, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead and behold, I am alive forevermore. I have the keys of death and of Hades. Therefore, write. The parallels between Daniel and Revelation are many, and this may be an additional parallel. That Daniel, the one writing the end time scenes of this great prophetic book, sees the glorified Christ. 
even as John the revelator saw the glorified Christ. Notice the question the angel asks of the man dressed in linen. Verse six, how long will it be until the end of these wonders? The angel's question is not asking about the start date of the great tribulation from the time of Babylonian captivity. He's not saying how long until the end from now. He's asking rather the question, how long will the great tribulation last? How long from the time of these wonders will the end be? How long does this have to go on? And we see the word wonders. We think, oh, how wonderful. No, not wonderful that way. Wonders, literally the Hebrew is astonishing things. The astonishing things just described for us in chapter 11 and chapter 12, the the tyranny of the Antichrist and his anti-God rule over the entirety of the earth. The unparalleled time of the tribulation, what Jesus called the worst time ever in human history. There would never be a time worse before nor a worse time after. The time of unprecedented trouble for the people of Israel, a time of unequaled world consuming conflagration, a time of unsurpassed blasphemies, those wonders. How long until those wonders come to an end? How long will these things last? The angel asks. The answer comes in verse seven. This man dressed in linen answers the question. The one who was above the waters of the river as he raised his right hand and his left toward heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it would be for a time, times and half a time. As soon as they finish shattering the power of the holy people, all these events will be completed. Notice first the man's appearance. He is dressed in linens, just like the being in Daniel chapter 10. He hovers over the waters and he has both hands raised. And he swears. We know in our day, oath-taking involves a raised hand. And this goes back almost as long as recorded history. That a hand was raised in solemnity to signify the seriousness of an oath. But here this being raises both hands. uh, Double solemnity. Uh, There is something really striking going on with this oath. Deuteronomy 32, 40 gives an interesting phrase. It says, I will lift my hand to heaven and say of the one who lives forever. It's a similar phrasing to what happens here. In fact, I want you to turn to Deuteronomy 32. We're going to read an extended portion of the song of Moses. Because there's an interesting tie here. If you're wondering if this truly is the glorified Christ seen here in this picture, why would Jesus swear by God? Doesn't that seem a little strange? And we have a a really interesting verse in the song of Moses in Deuteronomy 32. Deuteronomy 32, beginning in verse 36 We read a section of the song of Moses where Moses is, uh, where where the Lord is speaking through the song of Moses. Vengeance is mine, verse 35. God is talking about himself. And he says in verse 36, for Yahweh will vindicate his people. He will have compassion on his servants when he sees that their strength is gone and there is none remaining bond or free. And he will say, where are their gods? the rock in which they sought refuge, who ate the fat of their sacrifices and drank the wine of their drink offering. Let them rise up and help you. Let them be your hiding place. See now that I, I am he, and there is no God besides me. It is I who put to death and give life. I have wounded and it is I who can heal. And there is no one who can deliver out of my hand. Notice verse 40. Indeed, I, this is still Yahweh speaking. I lift up my hand to heaven and say, as I live forever, if I sharpen my flashing sword and my hand takes hold on justice, I will render vengeance on my adversaries. I will repay those who hate me. I will make my arrows drunk with blood. My sword will devour flesh with the blood of the slain from the captives, from the long haired leaders of the enemy. Rejoice, O nations, with his people. For he will avenge the blood of his servants and will render vengeance on his adversaries. 
and he will atone for his land and his people. There is a lot going on there in that section of the song of Moses. But I want you to just notice a couple of things as, as you listen to those words, you hear Yahweh speaking from the vantage point of Moses prior to the people being in the promised land for the first time. This predates Joshua and the conquest narrative. And yet God is talking to them about their exchange of him for idols while in the land. He's already indicting them for the idolatry he knows they will participate in. And he calls out to them, where are those gods you want to go after? Where are they? Why don't you call out to them? It is a taunt like Isaiah 40 to 48, where God says, who are you going to compare me with? And he makes that taunt right here in the song of Moses before Israel even gets into the land. He knows they're going to forfeit fidelity to Yahweh and pursue idolatries. And God himself knows it will bring them to emptiness and nothingness like idolatries always do. <laughs> Look what else we have in this song. God says, I am the only God there is. Indeed, I lift up my hand to heaven and say, as I live forever. So then we have this one dressed in linen who may very well be the pre-incarnate Christ in Daniel 12, 7, who raises his hand toward heaven and swears by him who lives forever. Parallel phraseology. God swears by God in both cases. And in both cases, we're dealing with land promises and atonement and the people of Israel and God's commitment to keep his promises to get his people into the land and bless them in spite of their idolatries. We also have here the, the making of God's arrows drunk with the blood of his enemies. And he's speaking there of the nations surrounding Israel. God will take vengeance on them and will repay those who hate him. And in case um, you're a mom in, in need of encouraging your son to get a haircut, here the enemies of God are called the long-haired leaders of the enemy. Sorry, I, don't, I couldn't resist. You also have in Deuteronomy 32, in this song of Moses, the command from Yahweh, rejoice, O nations, with God's people. And the concluding refrain of the song, God will atone for his land and his people. What do you have? The, the national entity of Israel in the midst of her enemies being a matter of rejoicing as God atones for the nation and for the land. And God swears by himself as he goes about these things. Interesting that we find this language right here in Daniel chapter 12. The man dressed in linen above the waters, raising right hand and left toward heaven in a solemn double-handed oath, swears by God who lives forever. And he answers the question about the timing of these awful atrocities called the great tribulation. The answer is right there in the middle of verse seven, a time times and half a time. But this is familiar to us already in Daniel. A time is one year. Times are two more years. And half a time adds a half year. That's three and a half years. We've looked at the parallels to the book of Revelation and, and seen that this matches what both Daniel and Revelation describe as a definite time and a limited time of three and a half years, 1260 days, 42 months, or the second half of Daniel's 70th week. Uh, a week of years was a seven-year period of time. The second half of that is a three-and-a-half-year period of time. And we learn from Daniel 9, 24 to 27, that God's very purpose, his very goal, the, the stated goal for this time frame given in the Bible, is to bring about the purification of Israel, the, the end of her stubborn hard-heartedness. Notice how this is described here in Daniel 12, 7. The finishing of the shattering of the power or the strength of the holy people. Holy people here is clearly a reference to Israel. The word for power is simply the word for hand. It can mean power or strength. It can mean military might. Or their strength here is just all used up. God is bringing them to their end. Literally, it says to complete the shattering of the strength of the holy people. That is the stated purpose of this period is to bring Israel to the end of her strength. 
This again is the Bible's stated goal for the great tribulation. Why does the great tribulation exist? For this purpose primarily to bring Israel to the end of herself. When Israel's national hard heart is broken, according to Zechariah chapters 12 through 14, Israel will be attacked and demolished by a consortium of many nations. The world will ally themselves against Israel, bring all of their armies against her, and she will be humiliated and brought to utter powerlessness. She will have no strength left. You know that Israel's combat record in the 20th century is remarkable. They win all the time. They win against all odds. In fact, I'm I'm rather proud of the record of the F-15 Eagle, the, the jet interceptor that Israel has used, and not a single one has been shot down. They have over 100 aerial victories and not one loss. That will not be the case in these days. They will be brought to utter powerlessness. This will break the nation's will and bring to an end her stubborn self-sufficiency. Turn to Zechariah chapter 12. And we've looked at this a number of times. This is just a key text for understanding the future of Israel. It's helpful for understanding God's heart in salvation, bringing salvation to the undeserving by overcoming rebellious hard-heartedness by supernatural power. But this is God's testimony. Zechariah 12, 8, Yahweh will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. The one who is feeble among them in that day will be like David. The house of David will be like God, the angel of Yahweh before them. And in that day, I will set about to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Uh, We'll come to those events in a moment. I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and of supplication. God will graciously give them a heart to call out to God for help. So that they will look on me, that is Yahweh, whom they have pierced. Very interesting language. And they will mourn for him. Interesting pronouns. They will look on me, Yahweh, whom they have pierced and mourn for him as for an only son. They will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. As we have said before, this is the weeping of repentance and faith. Finally, as a nation embracing their own Messiah. Look at Zechariah 14. What happens next? Then Yahweh will go forth and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. In that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives will be split in its middle from east to west by a very large valley so that half the mountain will move toward the north, the other half to the south. You will flee by the valley of my mountains, for the valley of the mountains will reach to Azel. Yes, you will flee just as you fled before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then Yahweh, my God, will come and all the holy ones with him. In that day, there will be no light. The luminaries will dwindle. It will be a unique day, which is known to Yahweh, neither day nor night, but will come about that at evening time there will be light. And in that day, living waters will flow out of Jerusalem half of them toward the eastern and half toward the western sea. It will be in summer as well as in winter. And then Yahweh will be king over all the earth. In that day, Yahweh will be the only one and his name, the only one. This is where all of this is headed. The shattering of the power of the holy people must come to pass before all these events are completed. How long will it take? Three and a half years. What events must transpire? The absolute leveling of the pride of Israel. Shattering her power. The summary of all of God's purposes for Daniel's 70 weeks are given in Daniel 9, 24. 
I'll remind you of those 70 weeks have been decreed for your people in your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy place. All of those things have to do with the bringing to the end of Israel's sin and bringing them into reconciliation with their God. That is the purpose for the 70 weeks. And that is culminated in Daniel's 70th week, the last and the last half of the 70th week, that period called the great tribulation. There's another question in this Q and a series. Look at verse eight. This is the prophet's question. As for me, I heard, but I could not understand. So I said, my Lord, what will be the outcome of these events? Daniel doesn't understand. (laughs) Isn't he writing this stuff down? Daniel himself has more questions. Isn't he the prophet? I don't know about you, but this is really comforting for me. In the 20th century as an interpreter, (laughs) If Daniel didn't understand and Daniel still has questions, boy, there are things I scratch my head about and I still have some questions. This is really comforting to us. Here's the deal. We have to know and we have to believe what God has revealed, but that very well may leave us with some questions. And you and I have to be careful to be satisfied with what God has been pleased to reveal. It's very tempting to want to go past it. But listen, our spiritual lives do not depend upon filling in the blanks or satisfying all of our curiosities. Our spiritual life does depend on believing and heeding every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. In fact, when you get to the book of Revelation, the book begins with this blessing promise. Blessed is everyone who reads and who heed the words of the prophecy of this book. We are obligated to read these things, even prophetic details, and to heed what's in there. That doesn't mean we're going to know all the answers. That doesn't mean we're going to know how all of it works out when it happens. Just like those who saw the predictions from Daniel's pen about the times leading up to Antiochus Epiphanes. No one was going to put all those pieces together and figure out exactly when and exactly how all those things would transpire until they actually transpired. And the contemporaries of those events had the best view of how they actually worked out. Now, that they worked out was predicted and clear and should be believed. How it all works out, best seen by the contemporaries. Daniel's question here in verse 8 could be read, what will be the outcome? But I think it's better to understand Daniel here to be asking, how will these things end? In other words, how will all these astonishing atrocities reach a conclusion? How will the Antichrist be defeated? How will the good guys get out of this impossible situation? Have you ever been engrossed in a really good story? One in which there seems to be no solution to the problems presented. The story has been recommended to you by people you trust, so you know it has to work out somehow. I mean, your friend wouldn't tell you to read a story that just is a total dud, where the good guys don't win and the problems aren't solved. So you know it has to work out somehow, but but you just don't know how. You can't figure it all out. Well, three and a half years will bring about the total obliteration of the strength of the nation of Israel. Israel has seen some tough times throughout history, but this will top them all. How could there be anything left of the people? How will the enemies of Israel be defeated? How will God keep his promises? I don't believe that Daniel had in doubt the good ending, but I believe he is genuinely perplexed here about how the good ending could possibly come about. And as we read these, we, we sit in those same shoes. How? How could someone as awful as Antichrist has been described come to his end? How could the good ending come about? How how could anybody survive such world destructive cataclysms and atrocities? And we have the man's answer in the rest of this chapter. Verses 9 to 13 constitute the answer to Daniel's question. There's a five-part answer here beginning in verse uh, verse 9. 
It begins in verse 9. He said, go your way, Daniel. That's the first part of the five-part answer. It is simply Daniel's duty. Daniel's duty. Go your way simply means, go, Daniel, live your life faithfully. Don't concern yourself with what's not revealed. See, after Daniel would come more revelation, things that would fill in some of Daniel's blanks, we get those filled in for our benefit, and yet there are still blanks for us. Uh, the command to Daniel here is, Daniel, just go live your life. Be faithful. Trust the Lord. The second part of the five-part answer is the security of the instructions given. The, the instructions here are secured for future use. Look at the second half of verse 9. Go your way, Daniel, for these words are concealed and sealed up until the end time. And we looked at this word earlier in the chapter. It doesn't mean these words are closed so as not to be read, sealed up in some sort of secret or mystery. Uh, No, they're, they're sealed up in terms of being preserved. This part of the book is closed. It's, it's, it's finished and it is to be preserved for future use. This is a promise from God that, that these words are safe and secure for the generation that will need them. Look back at Daniel 12, 4. Do you remember when we heard this concealing and sealing up last time? It, it came with this uh, declaration. Daniel, conceal these words, seal up the book until the end of time. Many will go back and forth and knowledge will increase. This word for going back and forth is a Hebrew way to describe looking for something, searching something out. What is it that's being searched out here? It is knowledge. And what is the result? That knowledge will increase. I believe that is, that is the knowledge of those who are wise and discerning and take action and know what to do during those times. They will search out even the instructions that God has given here in the book of Daniel and other places like Matthew 24 and 25 and Revelation 6 through 18. The knowledge of those things will increase so that the wise will have discernment and do as they ought to do. Again, what a kindness of the Lord that he gives instructions to those who will be faithful under fire during the worst period of human history and they will need to have authoritative instructions about what to do. God gives them that very thing, seals it up, secures it for that day of need. There's some insight here into prophetic details. God's communication is clear. Even in predictive prophecy, he he means what he says. He doesn't have a speech impediment. He has the ability to exactly communicate what he wants to communicate. We may have some barriers to God's clarity, right? Right? Sometimes when we look back at historical texts, we we have to cross the gap of 2,000 years or 3,500 years of history. We have to cross language gaps. We have to cross informational gaps like how big is a cubit? How much is a denarius worth? There are barriers for us understanding what God clearly said. And when we think forward to prophetic declarations, there are similar barriers for us. We're not sitting in the time frame in which those events will happen. We can't get a whole picture of the world as it is in those days. We can absolutely bank on what God says about it, even if we can't picture all of it in all of its clarity. But guess what? The people who will be there will see it and they will know it. That is God's literal future history. And just as those who sat in ancient times and knew very clearly what God meant by a cubit and a denarius... Those who sit in future times will have a clear view of what God communicated in his word for their benefit. And we can trust in that. There's a third part to the man's five part answer here in verse 10. And this has to do with the purification of Israel. Look down at verse 10. Many will be purged, purified, and refined, but the wicked will act wickedly. And none of the wicked will understand, but those who have insight will understand. This is the purification of a nation to love Christ. Right? Again, this goes back to the stated purpose of the Great Tribulation. God is out to purify his people. This is similar wording to Daniel 11.35. Some of those who have insight will fall in order to refine, purge, and make them pure until the end of time. 
This idea of a purging, a purification, a refining, it speaks of spiritual cleansing. A spiritual cleansing at a national level. Those who do not believe will be purged and cut off. But there will be a a group, a, a segment of Jews who do repent and do believe. And we have both of those categories here in this verse. The wicked will act wickedly. I think that's a reference to Jews who do not repent. There is, of course, the wicked world around them at that time. But I think this is marking out the difference between Jews who believe and Jews who don't. There will be those who have insight and wisdom on the basis of God's revelation and those who will continue to act wickedly. And I think it is a remarkable thing that during this most awful time, a time of universal terror that people will not repent. We have this testimony laid out for us in the book of Revelation. Revelation 6, 15 to 17, describes this time of universal terror this way. The kings of the earth and the great men and the commanders and the rich and the strong, every slave and free man hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for their great day of their wrath has come and who is able to stand. And you think about the levelizing reality of universal cataclysmic terror under the outpouring of the wrath of Jesus on the earth. Everybody will be equalized. The great men, the strong, the mighty, and the commanders inside the caves with the slaves and the lowly. And they're all calling out, rocks, just fall on us. Kill us now. Because they would rather go out of existence in their line of thinking than repent. And look in Revelation 6. They know it is God who is doing these things and it is the wrath of the Lamb they acknowledge. And they will not turn from their hard-heartedness. This testimony goes on. Listen to Revelation chapter 9, verse 20. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands so as not to worship demons and the idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and wood that can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders, nor their sorceries, nor their immoralities, nor their thefts. Revelation 16, 9. Men were scorched with fierce heat. They blasphemed the name of God who has the power over these plagues and they did not repent so as to give him glory. Revelation 16, 11. They blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and they did not repent of their deeds. Think about that. How hard does the human heart have to be To face all of these afflictions to the breaking point. I just want to go out of the world. I will not yield. That is a suicidal insanity in the heart of man. It seems that the only thing that will bring about a world united in devotion to Christ will be the personal return of Christ himself to the world. And notice verse 10. None of the wicked will understand But those who have insight will understand. The knowledge will increase. The discerning will understand. These things will make sense to the discerning when these events happen. And listen to Zechariah 13, 8 and 9. It will come about in the land, declares Yahweh. Two parts in it will be cut off and perish. And the third part will be left in it. And I will bring the third part through the fire, refine them as silver is refined, and test them as gold is tested. Zechariah here, talking about the nation of Israel, gives the promise that a third will survive. Those survivors will en masse be repenters and believers. But two-thirds cut off. Are those two-thirds wicked Jews who do not repent, or is it a mix of the wicked Jews who don't repent and the martyrs who believed and are killed? Perhaps, I'm not sure that Zechariah differentiates those in this text. But the third that is refined, the third that remains, Zechariah goes on to say in chapter 13, verse 9, they will call on my name, I will answer them, I will say they are my people, and they will say Yahweh is my God. 
This is exactly what Paul described in Romans eleven twenty seven. that day when all Israel will be saved. This is saving belief, saving repentance, a, a calling on Yahweh, a belonging to him and fidelity of heart. There's a fourth part of this five part answer from the man dressed in linen hovering above the river. This part of the answer has to do with, I don't know, post game activities, overtime, uh, extracurriculars. Not sure what to call these. Look down at verse 11. From the time that the regular sacrifice is abolished and the abomination of desolation is set up, there will be 1290 days. And how blessed is the one who makes it to the 1335. What is this 1290 and 1335? Uh, remember that the second half of Daniel's 70th week, the great tribulation marked from the abomination of desolation was 42 months, three and a half years, or 1260 days. 1290 minus 1260 is what? 30. You got 30 extra days. What are these days doing here? Remember, this is marked from the abomination of desolation. Uh, we ask, what, what is the abomination of desolation? This is the abomination which desolates. Does that clear it up? A literal Hebrew rendering there. That which is abominable that brings about a desolation. We get a little clue in Mark 13, 14. The abomination of desolation there is marked out as a he a masculine participle is used to describe it. And in Revelation 13, uh, chapter 13, verses 14 and 15, the world is required to worship some depiction of the Antichrist. I think it's reasonable to explain the abomination of desolation under Antichrist is different than the abomination of desolation under Antiochus Epiphanes IV in the second century BC. Remember, he set up a temple to Zeus in the altar in the temple in Jerusalem. He was a, a worshiper of the gods of his fathers. The Antichrist will not be a worshiper of the gods of his fathers. He will worship the God of military might that his fathers did not know. And the abomination of desolation in his day, of which Antiochus IV was merely a prototype, this worst of all abomination of desolations, which Jesus said was still future from Jesus' day, so it can't be Antiochus Epiphanes. This worst of all abomination of desolations is Antichrist setting up himself to be worshipped in the temple in Jerusalem, demanding the whole world worship him. Again, this is the height of all blasphemies. And so this 1290 is marked from that moment, the midpoint of the tribulation, the start of the great tribulation, the start of the three and a half years and the 1260 days until it is done. So what happens between 1260 and 1290? Well, turn in your Bible to the book of Revelation and chapter 19. And the book of Revelation is laid out mostly chronologically. There are a couple of scene changes and flashbacks, but in Revelation chapter 1, you have John's vision of Christ. In Revelation 2 and 3, you have the letters to the seven churches. There was, those were seven actual churches in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, that existed in the first century. Jesus had messages for those actual churches. Revelation 4 and 5 are a scene of the throne room in heaven. And then Revelation 6 through 18 are Daniel's 70th week. That is the, the period of time, the, the seven-year period of time known as the, the tribulation, marked in the midpoint by Antichrist being worshipped in the temple, marked in the middle by the abomination of desolation. And the wrath of God is poured out in three series of telescoping judgments from heaven on the earth dwellers during that time. And in fact, the book of Revelation is given an outline in chapter 1 where uh, the, the messenger tells John, write, John, Write three things. Write what you have seen. That is the vision of Christ in chapter one. Write what is present, meaning the present state of the churches in John's day in Asia Minor. And write what is to come. That is the future events falling out of that. So uh, everything from six on is future from John's perspective. And six through 18 lays out the, the details, mostly chronological, of this tribulation period, this 70th week of Daniel. What follows after Revelation 18 
is Revelation 19. This is what ends the great tribulation. This is the return of Christ to the earth. Look at Revelation 19, 11. I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse and the one who sat on it called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire on his head are many diadems. He has a name written on him, which no one knows but himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations. He will rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun and he cried out with a loud voice saying to all the birds which fly in mid heaven, come assemble for the great supper of God so that you may eat the flesh of kings and commanders, the flesh of mighty men and horses and those who sit on them, the flesh of all men, free men and slaves, the small and the great. And I saw the beast that's antichrist. And the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was seized and with him, the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped his image. These two, the beast and the false prophet were thrown alive into the lake of fire, which burns with brimstone and the rest were killed with the sword that came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse and all the birds were filled with their flesh. 1260 days in Daniel marks the end of antichrist's tyranny. What happens for the 30 days between the 1260 and the 1290? Well, all those birds have to eat all those corpses. There's a little bit of cleanup there at the great supper. There is the battle. We don't know how long it takes. When you read Revelation 19, it just seems like, well, beast and false prophet plucked off the battle scene, tossed, armies killed, done. Sword coming out of Jesus' mouth. It seems to go rather quickly. It seems to be rather anticlimactic. At least what we have in between the 1260 and the 1290 is the return of Christ. However long that battle takes, how long, however long it takes the birds of the air to feast on the corpses of those killed in battle. And then you have Matthew chapter 25. Turn there for just a moment. In Matthew chapter 25, beginning in verse 31, you have one of the great eschatological judgments. They're not all the same. Uh, if you work out the details of the various judgments depicted in Scripture of the end times, there are several and they are different. This is the, the sheep and the goats judgment. It's different than the Bema Seat judgment, which is a reward for believers. And it's different than the great white throne judgment, which happens after the thousand year millennial kingdom. This is verse 31, Revelation 19. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. The nations will be gathered before him. He'll separate them from one another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Sheep on his right, goats on his left. And the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And then he gives a description of those who are believers and blessed and survivors of the tribulation entering the blessedness of the kingdom. How are they described? They helped out Jesus people in times of trouble. Then verse 41, he will say to those on his left, depart from me, accursed ones into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. Why? They did not live out lives as believers. Verse 46, these will go away into eternal punishment. This sheep and goats judgment takes place between the 1260 and the 1290. I don't know how long that'll take, but we do have these numbers from Daniel. And the next indication is given there in verse 12, how blessed is the one who keeps waiting for the 1335, the idea of keeps waiting and attaining here is simply the idea of eager anticipation. How blessed you are eagerly anticipating the 1335. Uh, this is now 75 days after Antichrist's reign of tyranny is done. 
So we've got the 30 days, then another 45 days for a total of 75 days. 75 days have passed since the worst period of human history has come to an end. I pulled out some old newspaper headlines from VJ Day. That was the end of World War II in the Pacific Theater, the the end of the war. It's celebrated in America September 2nd, but it was August 14th, 1945, when the American people heard over the radio for the first time that Japan had surrendered unconditionally and the war that had consumed the world was over. And you read the newspaper headlines from that day, and there is worldwide rejoicing. Strangers kissing each other in the middle of the street, gifts being given, rejoicing everywhere. Can you imagine the scene here for those who have survived the great tribulation and all that they have endured for the cessation of hostilities, the the chief enemies plucked up and tossed alive into the lake of fire and all the enemy army armies decimated. What's going on for these 75 days? Uh, Clean up. The great white throne, I'm sorry, the sheep and goats, judgment. And then, then what? What, what, are these, what are these days for? People have given a number of suggestions. Um, perhaps the setting up of the administration for the government of this new era of humanity. There will be a number of people who will be given responsibilities in the kingdom. Old Testament saints, tribulation martyrs, and church era believers are all promised land and responsibilities in this kingdom. Perhaps this 75 days or these last 45 days are when these responsibilities are divvied up. But notice verse 12, how blessed, how blessed is the one eagerly anticipating? How great will it be at the cessation of hostilities to be thinking, Wow, this is it. It's happening. After millennia of tainted humanity, ruining the earth, despoiling the very existence for which we were placed on God's globe, it's finally coming. This will be the golden era of humanity that lasts for a thousand years. And even its reign will not end for when there is a new heaven and a new earth, this glorious reign will go on into eternity future. And for here, for these thousand years on this earth, world peace, Jesus on his throne on the earth, ruling the nations with a rod of iron, Satan imprisoned, unable to deceive the nations. What will the world culture be at that point? It will be Jesus culture. The curse will be reversed, very nearly eliminated, not totally until new heavens and new earth, but very nearly eliminated. This is the culmination of Sabbath rest for humanity. It is the keeping of God's promises for land, blessing, prosperity, and a people, and a blessing through that people to all the nations. Humanity at this point is about to walk into an Eden-like utopia on planet earth. And the participants of this glorious era will surely look back on the dark times that immediately preceded it, amazed at the mercy of God, marveling at the glories of the kingdom as a great, clear, sparkling diamond against the black velvet backdrop of the wickedness of man at his Tower of Babel worst. This is a good day. Could you imagine? 75 days. Can we put up one of those popcorn strings and eat one piece of popcorn and count down the days till the 1335 is done? Eagerly anticipating. The fifth part of the five part answer comes in verse 13. This goes back to Daniel's duty and his unique privilege. Verse 13. As for you, Daniel, go your way to the end. Then you will enter into rest and rise again for your allotted portion at the end of the age. The word end is used two different ways in this verse. The first is the end of Daniel's life. The end is the end of this era. What is the instruction given to Daniel? Live faithfully, die, rise again, get your plot. That's the instruction. And that's what closes the book of Daniel. It's really remarkable. Daniel, live faithfully out the rest of your life and then die. That that will be your rest. 
And, and while your body lies horizontal, to be absent from the body again is to be present with the Lord. There is physical resurrection coming. Look, don't ever believe anybody that says there was no Old Testament hope of the resurrection. Here it is. Daniel got a specific promise that Daniel 12, 2 would be applied to him. How is that for personal assurance? Daniel, take your rest and you will rise again. And you will rise again for your allotted portion. Allotted portion in the Hebrew is just one word. It's used 25 times in the book of Joshua, verse, uh, chapters 14 to 21, to describe the dividing up of the promised land for the people of Israel. It was used not only for the lot cast to decide who gets what, but also for the lot, that is the plot of land, apportioned. So Daniel here is to receive a geographical inheritance in the promised land. Not only do we see here Old Testament resurrection hope, but Old Testament land promises to be literally fulfilled to Old Testament saints. Remember the promises God made to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the patriarchs? Sometimes setting a foot in the promised land, but not getting to live there. You remember what Joseph did? He had his bones hauled off, carried there after he died. Hebrews 11.22 remarks about that Old Testament hope in the confidence of God's promises. By faith, he set his heart toward the things he did not actually yet have. Well, guess what? He will. God will keep his promises. And the promises that Old Testament saints believed in will actually be fulfilled. They don't get written away. They don't get spiritualized. They don't get handed to somebody else. God keeps his promises. They will get to live in the land. Let me give us a few closing takeaways here as we round out Daniel 12 and round out the book of Daniel. First of all, from this evening, just rest contented in what God has revealed. Rest contented in what God has revealed. He's revealed a lot more than I'll get to in my lifetime, studying diligently. I know that. It's not like you plateau. You go, okay, I stood in front of that wall out there and I read every word on the Bible wall done. No, every time you open your Bible, you're going to see more that was there all the time. So don't stop. But we don't go beyond what's written either. We just need to be contented with what God has revealed. Number two, think for a moment about what it takes to bring Israel to repentance as a nation. All the armies of the world aligned against her. All the trouble, all the exiles, all the disbursement among the nations, 20th century Holocaust, still hard hearts. Evangelists traipsing back and forth across Israel, talking to any Jew that will listen to them. Have you read Isaiah 53? I don't want to. What will it take? The most awful, troubling, purging, sorrow, and loss in all of their troubled, storied history involving a world-encompassing tribulation. All of the nations aligned militarily against her, all-out satanic onslaught, and the outpouring of divine wrath in successive telescoping judgments. Cataclysms the world has not yet seen. Friend, where are you with the Lord? Do you find your heart resisting his mercy? Trying his patience? What will it take to break the stubbornness of your own hard heart? Israel gets a guarantee that as a nation, there will be national repentance. That's not a guarantee to any individual Jew. There is no guarantee for you. That as an individual who has rejected Christ thus far, you will get one more breath or have another opportunity to hear the gospel. Friend, do not hold out. Don't resist. Relent. Repent. Turn your life over to the king of the earth while you still have time. Another takeaway Listen, Christian, your duty is to live a faithful life, to live your life faithfully, to do your duty, to finish your work, to to run the race that God has laid out for you. Do you remember the scene at the end of the gospel of John? 
Peter's talking to Jesus, and he's talking to Jesus about the Apostle John. Peter said, Lord, what about, what about him? Jesus said, if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Therefore, this saying went out among the brethren that that disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die, but only if you want him, if I want him to remain until I come, what's that to you? That's just a good reminder for us. That's essentially what's being said to Daniel here. Am I going to get back to the land of Israel? Am I leaving Babylonian captivity? Am I going to see the end of all of these things? Will, will I get a place in the kingdom? Just rest. You, you'll have your lot. All of these things are in God's hands. Listen, Christian, your duty is to take God's word at face value, to believe him, to trust in him, and it doesn't matter what God does with anyone else. Yeah, but I want to I wanna live long enough to be here for the rapture. Well, maybe. But, but what if that guy gets to? Well, what is that to you? You follow me. Be faithful. If you were one of these believers who was alive during the time of the great tribulation, you might ask, will I make it to the end? Will, will I get to enter into the kingdom in my mortal state or, or will I be martyred? I don't know. Be faithful. It's all in God's hands. God wanted Daniel to finish out his days being faithful to Persian overlords in Babylonian captivity. You know where Daniel's hope was? And God's promises for land and blessing and prosperity and Messiah's kingdom to come to the earth and smash all those human kingdoms. Faith. Faith in a reality that Daniel himself would not see in his lifetime. But would be real and secure for him nonetheless. Who knows what God has for you? Just be faithful. Fourth takeaway, Christian... Live a faithful life and conclude your days such that you could have a verse 13 assurance. What was said to Daniel in verse 13? Daniel, go live the rest of your life, die, and rise again and get your inheritance. How good would it be to live your life faithfully to Christ? That at the end of your days here, you could with confidence breathe your last and look forward to your inheritance. Live that way, Christian. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this book. For the examples in six chapters of men who lived faithfully before you under trial, persecution, fire, and lions. And for another six chapters of the unfolding of the audacity of rebellious humanity against you and your faithfulness, sovereign over every dynasty, over every empire on a short leash in your hand, faithful to bring about your kingdom in the end, you will reign forever. You are our king. You are king in our hearts. You are king of the universe. You are king of all kings. And one day you will reign manifestly on the earth. And so we pray, even as you taught us to pray, your kingdom come.